So in this lecture, we'll be starting a, a sequence about where people live and the houses they build, the temples, castles, and all the other things they build and the stuff that they make them out of. So this is uh, a very amusing painting. Um, probably already after the lecture so far, you'll realize how very inaccurate this painting is. For instance, these people live in a cave, but this woman is carrying a polished axe head, which would be of the Neolithic period. Um, also, by the time you get modern looking humans, they pretty much worked out how to make clothes and weren't just wrapping things around them. So we'll be talking more about clothes later on. But what we're talking about today is we'll start talking about homes. And of course, caves are very important homes, but there's not a lot of to say about them with regards to stuff. However, people started making homes out of things, out of stuff. Um, one of the earliest examples of this is a site called Terra Amata in the south coast of France, um, which was at the time right on the beach. Now this shows a, a, a bunch of people running around with no clothes on, which is probably okay for 380,000 years ago. Um, I'm not so sure about the sticks. So you can see here, they are just picking up any old stick, any old place. Um, the evidence at Terramata would suggest that they kept going back to the site. And there's something that happens when you cut down sticks is they grow back. And they grow back straighter than they did before. And so although this looks like a very prehistoric pile of sticks, I would imagine as they kept coming back, they would be coming back to what were in fact pollard pollarded uh, trees and getting very nice straight pieces of wood. But never mind that. But so, of course, you can imagine what uh, vestigial archaeological traces there'd be from this sort of occupation. Uh, just some holes in the ground, little post holes, very small post holes in this case. Uh, arrangements of stones, occupation floors, fires, and that sort of thing. And so this sort of thing is uh, very difficult to get preserved, and so is probably a lot more common than we would know from the archaeological record. Possibly even for, far more common than caves, as people moved around in areas where probably a bit of shelter was a, a nice idea then they probably would have made shelters. This is a rather later shelter. This is from the Ukraine. And we have evidence of it because they used the bones of uh, mammoths to, uh, to make the house with. So of course, it doesn't rot away like sticks do. And so they're just basically sitting there on the ground. And archaeologists have reconstructed that they would have built a house out of it. So buildings like this just put together and uh, using available materials, uh, this one's actually from Central Asia, would have been very common around the world. Uh, this one looks like just some logs they've leaned against a central post and there you go, you have a house. So they may move around, might take this door with them, it's a nice looking door, throw that on the side of a camel or something, um, but most of this would have been acquired from just the countryside. Having houses you take it with them, or along with you, would be along the lines of tents. So there is some vestigial inf uh, sort of uh, archaeological traces of, of tents, but uh, probably the best evidence is in depiction like this. Uh, this is a Neo-Assyrian uh, wall relief uh, showing a military encampment with tents in it. And tents were very important to the Neo-Assyrians. Uh, the Neo-Assyrian king, king list goes back to their first kings, which were described as being kings who lived in tents. So the Neo-Assyrian leadership uh, reckoned their ancestors back to a mobile population. Uh, moving around in tents, rather like the Bedouin do to this day. So here we can see cross-sections through these tents, 
and they're quite interesting because they don't seem to have any regularity in how these cross braces come out from the central posts, which may suggest they're actually a tree. A tree has been cut down um, and pruned to the right size and possibly another bough bent across the top, or this may just be a section. Uh, here you can see what the tent looked like from the outside, which doesn't necessarily look like what it looks like this way. It might have been that this is we're looking about here or somewhere. So here's another one. You can see again the the lack of organized structuring, but you can see here's someone's dog and his seat and uh, everything you'd want. This is a more detailed picture. This is a a, a royal tent. Here's like the head Neo Assyrian. This is his tent. And you can see here the guy lines. So this shows you a bit better that how this tent would have been put together. You'd have these posts, which have been slightly stuck into the ground, not significantly probably, and they'd have been tied to the ground with these guy lines, a very important part of tent construction. And then there's this this round bit on the top. So this is sort of like a, a wall that goes around the tent, and this is something within the tent that creates the shelter. Possibly open on the inside. This is a, another famous tent. This is the tabernacle. So in the book of Exodus, it describes uh, when the Hebrews left Egypt uh, to go to the promised land, uh, they lived in tents for 40 years. Um, and of course, they would have probably had relationships with uh, tent dwelling people before and after. So they lived in tents and their main shrine was a tent, a big tent. And so this is described in the book of Exodus. It's very long. I just want you to be horrified by how much writing there's involved. Uh, the, <clears throat> the pithy bit says the tabernacle was made of curtains of fine twisted linen. There are 50 clasps of gold. There are also curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle with 50 class of bronze. And there are upright frames of acacia wood for the tabernacle with bars of acacia wood. The acacia wood's interesting. When we get to um, the wood uh, lectures, you'll find that acacia is a very common, the most common uh, type of wood available in Egypt. Uh, where these people went to, uh, acacia is a lot less common. So this tradition of acacia wood presumably came from Egypt. And you should also make a court of the tabernacle. So there have been a number of reconstructions of this and they're all quite amusing. This one's quite nice. So you can, here you can see the court that goes around it. See the upright posts and the guy ropes. And here we have the tabernacle itself with all the acacia wood parts. All of this would have needed to be taken down, thrown over the back of a camel or a donkey, and then moved to the next location. And here you can see this person's reconstructed the everybody else's tents rather like Bedouin tents. Here's another reconstruction. You can see this is a lot more solid. I, I would find it unlikely to hear the clasps it was talking about, ways of, of, of linking one part of the structure to another. This is, uh, I would find it unlikely that this could be thrown on the back of a camel. It's probably been a much lighter, far more tent-like structure. So with regards to tents, ethnography probably tells us more about their typology than archaeology. But it's interesting to know about the variety of tents so we can actually see, hopefully, traces of them in the archaeological record. Uh, this is a tunnel tent. Uh, this is uh, in Iran and uh, you can see it's a tunnel because they've got these bent pieces of wood with the textile thrown over it. This is a black textile. I would assume this is goat hair. Goat hair is very very popular because all these people have goats. So here's how 
the tunnel works. So this is a, a very uh, thought to be an early type of tent. Here we have a slightly more elaborate thing it's called an armature tent. And so you can see it has a tunnel going one way and a tunnel going the other way and it creates this dome like structure. So a bit of weaving in between here and you can actually make quite a decent home throw a few rocks around the outside and Bob's your uncle. Probably hardly any of this would need to be taken from place to place except again possibly the door. So then we have uh, the, the well-known Bedouin style of tent probably of uh, some antiquity. Again the, the uh, goat hair inside you can see walls so the interior would have walls like this to separate different areas as well as around the margin of the tent and you can see the uprights probably with guy ropes on the other side rather like uh, the neo-assyrians uh, this is interesting it's got uh, a reeds so the reeds may have actually come from southern iraq and were used are used to make divisions within the tent this is a Kurdish tent. Again, you can see the goat hair. It's quite a big one. Um, there was, There is, of course, nomadism just about everywhere in the Middle East. And there's a lot of uh, nomadism where the Kurds live in the mountains of the Zagros and Taurus Mountains. And so they're going around with their goats and living in tents. This is a uh, rather an old painting of Kurdish uh, nomadic people. Uh, with these uprights and the black textile. How accurate it is, it's hard to say, but it doesn't look too dissimilar from things like this. This is actually, actually a, a Kashkai tent from the Zagros Mountains. And here's the interior. So you can see it, it's still very similar. Then we come to what are called yurts or gares, uh, depending on the origin of the person saying the word. So these are round and continue to this day. Very popular. Um, you can see, of course, some of this would be carried around. In fact, all of this, I mean, you consider how in a, inhospitable and how little raw materials there are to find in this area. All of this is carried with you. So here you have, you build a wall out of uh, pieces of wood and a roof and a door all of these can be carried this big wheel like structure at the top see here is uh, one in iran <clears throat> where they are going from place to place and here on, thrown on the back of a camel is that part of the of the yurt or gare and here is covered with felt and then it'll be covered with uh, with other textiles until you have the final look and the final um, home and so, of course, we do have evidence of these things in the archaeological record. Uh, these are from the Ukraine, from the 5th, 8th centuries. So then we come <clears throat> to other uh, mobile structures like this. Uh, this you've seen before, of course, when we're looking at uh, stones and rocks and things. And what's interesting about it in this case is the motif on it. And here you can see these structures with their tall columnar things sticking up the top. And of course what these are, as is well known, are these structures called mudif nowadays in southern Iraq, uh, in the marshlands. And you can see how, you can imagine how this might have carried on and had sort of elaborate things on the top and would have been very closely related to what we see on those early seals. The interiors of these mudif can be very elaborate. Um, these are important buildings um, in this part of the world. So in earlier times, this is uh, Uruk here. And so you can see how a lot of this would have been marshland and reeds would have been very common. and the people of these very important centers of al Bayid or Uruk were basically marsh livers, marsh dwellers. 
and here we have ordinary houses um, made in the same way with with uh, woven we reeds of course the the uh, the nicer ones the mudif are very very nice and palace like and uh, something that I, I think I don't know if any like proper ancient Mesopotamian archaeologist has ever followed up on this although I've been suggesting it for many years uh, these columns from uh, Uruk are very odd in that they don't seem to match other forms of architecture and these round half columns and even these columns themselves of course all we have is like the bottom 30 40 centimeters of this so we don't really know what happens above here but I have to wonder if it's not a lot like this and since we're looking at this part of the world and they're putting buildings like this on their cylinder seals it wouldn't surprise me if in fact these things are the bases of things like this just a hypothesis so in Egypt of course there are reeds there as well lots of reeds in fact very popular make rock paper out of it and other stuff but also they make buildings out of it so again very early evidence of buildings are in fact made of wood with uh, reeds and are very like big tent like this is a very famous one at Nekin uh, also known as Hierakonopolis Hierakonopolis there's no missing in that word uh, which is the Greek word for it much later um, but is actually quite old oh, this is a different date and so here's another reconstruction of it and of course all that we have of this is the ground with the holes in it but it appears that it had reeds as a wall uh, covered with mud there were posts and a pile of mud and another wall which may have had religious significance and possibly the shrine itself so why these individuals are praying in this direction I have no idea I, I suspect this is probably not the correct place to pray towards so you're probably wondering how can we know what it looked like because that looks, that looks like very distinct and uh, the, where they get that idea from is actually from the hieroglyph for shrine which uh, isn't is distinct from the hieroglyph for temple um, and has this very odd roof and the section this way the this profile looks rather like this so that's why it's been reconstructed with this crazy looking roof so temporary shelters like this or you know quite long shelters but mobile are widespread in this period and here's a, a potter's house So when they did start making things out of stone, very important site at Saqqara, the uh, the pyramid of Jeriket or Djoser. Um, here's his pyramid, and this is the complex of buildings around it. And when you look carefully at all this, it is actually trying to look like wooden houses. Uh, it's they're all solid, and so basically they've created this palace complex for the dead out of stone but the original buildings would have been made of wood and reeds below the pyramid is uh, down here is the actual burial chamber and and uh, rooms associated with it and some of them have what appears to be reed matting on the walls made out of ceramic glazed ceramic been very nice at the time um, and so here you can see a wall with a door in it which is like been taken somewhere else and put up and here this reconstruction shows um, what would have been a roll of the the matting which probably could have been put down and lifted up so uh, a lot of people think oh well, this is probably a stone or mud brick building covered with reed matting but another possibility is in fact that this is a building made of wood and reed matting and is essentially a, a tent um, made of reed matting and of course that would make it very nice 
the the breeze would have come right through it it would have been created shelter and been quite a, a suitable uh, structure to live in um, but yeah mud brick is good too so there we have tents tents are, are very useful for people who are moving around but once you start to settle down you probably want to start building something else and we're start looking at the technology needed to start doing that in the next lecture.